Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to talk about the meaning of the 12 houses and do a review of the topics of the 12 houses, uh, specifically considering what do we think about those houses and their meanings when we're looking at the charts of young children, um, and especially, uh, and also I should say, uh, people who have retired. I get these questions a lot whenever we do horoscopes. It's like, yeah, but what about if I want to look at my kid's chart, how does career make any sense for my seven-year-old, right? Or maybe a lot, actually quite a few of our viewers are in retirement phase of life. And so the question has come to me many times, hey, look, I feel a little left out here because when you do horoscopes, you're not really mentioning what the meanings of these houses could be for someone who's no longer, you know, uh, grinding and hustling out there trying to earn a living or maybe that phase of life with career is over. Um, or for those people who, um, you know, for example, there's a lot of people who are career parents, right? So do we look at the 10th house in the same way? I get a lot of these kinds of questions. So I thought, let's look at the meetings of the houses today from the standpoint of, um, it, like, let's say, cutting out the middle portion of life where it's like young adulthood through retirement. If we just put it, bracket it that way, the house meetings are pretty consistent during that period. But what about early you like youth and then what about retirement phase of life do the house meanings change at all uh, so we'll, that's what we're going to take a look at today i think you guys will enjoy this it'll be something for all of you out there who are studying astrology or those of you who like to listen to horoscopes and uh and you know i'll do my best to also try to touch on and include these kinds of topics in the horoscopes themselves so um yeah it's something that has been a little unconsciously left out on my part so we'll we'll make sure we do a better job with that <clears throat> All right. Well, before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe and share your comments and reflections today. We'd love to hear from you guys. If you want, you can find a transcript of my daily talks on my website, nightlightastrology.com. Right now, we are also in promotion mode for my upcoming course, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic. So in particular, I want to take you over to the website, nightlightastrology.com. And when you get there, you go to the courses tab and you click on the first year course. It's going to take you over and you can learn more about the first year program. We begin November 18th. And so if you want, you can scroll through this page and learn all about the curriculum of the program, what's included here from some alumni talking about their experiences. There are 30 classes on the year. We also have 12 guest lectures. We have breakout study sessions. We have an, a webinar uh, or excuse me, a forum discussion uh, staffed with tutors a discussion forum, I should say, staffed with tutors that are there to help you break out study sessions with our tutors in between major units of study. You can email me throughout the whole course. We have lots of good Q&A sessions after our main topics for the day are over. So there's a lot of support in helping you learn how to read birth charts if that's something you want to do, or if you just want to take your interest in astrology to the next level. Now, at the bottom of the page, you're going to find the different payment options. Early bird payment saves you a good $500 off. There's a 12-month payment plan for those of you who need it. But what I really want to promote is we have now opened up enrollment for our need-based tuition. So if you are someone who would like to take the program, but your budget, your life situation makes it difficult to do so, uh, we want we always have provided a need-based tuition option for people to make sure that people aren't priced out from studying a sacred subject like astrology. So need-based tuition is now open. You can take advantage of that, enroll, um, and we do have a limited amount of those. So we ask people, if you're going to use the need-based tuition, enroll now, enroll early so that we can get you all signed up. Uh, you just hit the apply now button and uh, that it's pretty self-explanatory. So hope to see some of you in class soon. And if you have any questions about anything involving uh, that first year course, the enrollment early bird or uh, uh, payment plans or the need-based tuition, email us info at nightlightastrology.com. All right, let's take a look at the houses. Now, I'm just going to throw up the real-time clock, and I'm going to highlight the houses, and uh, and off we go. So we're going to talk about the meanings of the houses and how they can be understood in relation to the different stages of life. Now, for most people, when they hear me talking about the house meanings and horoscopes, you're getting a pretty mundane level of interpretation. It becomes very nuanced when we're doing birth chart readings or more um, sophisticated delineations uh, through forecasting techniques and so forth. So, you know, 
horoscopes are always simplified. They're always, um, you know, they, they, they cannot take into consideration the um, nuances of the birth chart. Uh, but they can give you some useful information. And if you listen to your rising sign horoscope, the house, the houses will align with the whole sign version of your birth chart, which is what ancient astrologers use. They used whole sign houses. So it becomes a very um, effective way of looking at where the transits are moving in your, the big transits of the month and how they're moving through your chart every month, which is why I always tell people I recommend for horoscopes listening to your rising sign. But regardless, um, the house meanings are going to be mostly the same for everyone in the middle portion of life. Let's say, you know, 18, leaving home, going to college, uh, all the way through, say, retirement. They largely take on the same meanings. Uh, but what happens if you're in, you know, uh, you're, you're seven years old or you're 10 years old? Or what happens if you are, uh, you're finished with the working phase of life and you're in retirement? Uh, so let's go through the angular house meanings first. And I'm going to use, oh, <laughs> the giant circle is back. Okay. I'm going to use some of the, uh, some traditional Indian ideas from early uh, Indian astrology to help us understand. So the first house in Indian astrology is sometimes called Dharma. It's related to this philosophical category of Dharma. You have Dharma, Arta, Kama, Moksha. And these are like four philosophical areas of life that all humans are um, naturally inclined to pursue. Dharma is the sense of who I am and what is natural to me. Uh, you could say from a first house astrological point of view, people have been talking about the word Dharma and what it means for a long time. And it has many different meanings. But one of the loose translations of the word is like a, like a duty. But this is a kind of duty that's innate to your character, to your soul, to your karma, to your body. And so at all stages of life, first house transits have to do with the formation and shaping of character, as well as the formation and shaping of our bodies. Uh, and it also has to do with our vitality and our health. Um, that stands at any stage of life. So there's not much that really changes about the first house throughout the different uh, stages of life and ages of life. It always has to do with your character and your sense of what you're here to do in whatever stage of life you are in, what feels innate, what feels true, what feels authentic, um, and what feels like maybe a sacred sense of, of duty or service, but not so much in terms of a career as much as it is in terms of the way you, it's, it's more about the way you're actually living, about the character that you're inhabiting. Like if you were an actor on a stage, this is how well can I inhabit the character that I'm meant to play. And that is true for all stages of life. In the early stage of life, let's say before you know our, our 20s, a lot of the first house has to do with the shaping and earliest formation of character, becoming conscious of who we are and what role we're here to play. And the rest of the life in some ways is about refining it. A later stage in life might be a little bit more about <clears throat> harvesting the lessons that we've learned from the role that we've played and also reflecting on and releasing uh, elements of character that, you know, are, are ready to be released. I think, you know, the, the people that I know in retirement who are the most interesting, in, at least in my life, have been those who have not stopped asking, who am I? How am I evolving and changing? Because it's an important question that we carry with us from this lifetime into uh, wherever our soul journeys next. So uh, that would be the first house, Dharma. Let's go through the rest of the angular houses. So we go to the tenth house, and we get to um, we get to the place that in Indian astrology is sometimes referred to as Arta. And there's you know again like there's <laughs> there's thousands of years of people writing, thinking, and talking about this philosophical area of life. Um, robust, you know, almost like a almost like if you were to enter into in academia, it's like entering into a conversation that has, uh, you know, a thousand years of footnotes, you know, so um, Arta, though, loosely means the pursuit of success or mastery within recognized hierarchies, like, for example, uh, 
how good of a musician am I relative to most musicians? So mastery, rank, achievement, but also power, wealth, fame. There can be ways in which we pursue, and, and all human beings are said to you know, pursue um, these areas. So the 10th house, when you're little, it may not be about career because career is just one way that we have of talking about the pursuit of uh, societal relevance and recognition. Some people never aspire to be famous, but they may aspire to feel like they're doing something that matters. Maybe what they're doing matters only to their family. Uh, but it's about taking pride in the work that you do, why you're doing it, um, how good you are at what you do, um, what it's earned you in the world, what, what you, what little moral or spiritual or, or physical, you know, trophies you have in your little trophy case, so to speak. So Arta can be really twisted. It's, you know, this 10th house can be the place where people seek dominion over other souls. It can also be um, a place where uh, we lose our dharma, our sense of who we are in the pursuit of wealth and fame and success or mastery. Um, upward mobility can take us away from our truest selves. And so there's natural tension between dharma and arta. We ideally want to be who we are and do things that we feel are respected, respected or respectable. Uh, we want to gain mastery, but not at the cost of our soul. You know, that kind of thing. I want to be a good astrologer while still being Adam, you know? So Arta looks a little different for children, you know, than it does adults, than it does someone who's retired. This sphere of life when you're a little child may have to do with just starting to develop a sense of what what we could do that we could we could become good at that we like doing that's also the question of dharma comes in what's me and what can i do to achieve something or do something respectable or gain some kind of mastery and as kids we're trying things on and as kids we're also gaining some of our first socially recognized success at school uh through our families um through uh, the communities that we belong to, how are we being recognized? How do we stand out? What are we, what are we struggling with in that area too? It's not just, some people think, well, you know, my, my kid's really struggling at school. Well, that might be because of the transits that are happening to the 10th house ruler or planets in the 10th that are going through a turbulent period where the child is struggling to feel like they're good at anything or they have any d degree of respect involved. You know, Melissa over there is doing Beyonce moves on stage and singing at the top of her lungs on America's Got Talent. You know what I mean? So, but we all, all humans have the desire to do something and to, to play a role socially. So we have a character that we're embodying in the first house. And that character is, it needs its own development. It's like, I need to play Adam well. So that's a first house con consideration. And it involves my health and my body too. And the 10th house is I need to play a role out in the world well. And then I might also have to deal with various urges for power or wealth or success or domination. I may have to contend with those issues in my soul on some level. Now, those kinds of considerations are also going on for people who are retired. It's not like they just stop. When you're retired, you may not be seeking that kind of, let's call it like a validation. You may not be seeking recognition, validation, or success uh, in a career any longer. Maybe you feel like you've already reached the a mountaintop. But the same area of life is still active. Why? How am I relevant now that I'm, you know, like in India, it's like the Vanaprastha ashram. It's like I've, I've retreated into the woods, so to speak, you know. I'm not in the city any longer in the hustle and bustle. Even if you live in the city, you get what I'm saying that these are metaphors. So what makes me socially relevant? How do I play a continued role socially? And for some people, the answer will be, I don't, I'm not interested. In which case then it becomes about 
how you stay engaged with a social reality. Now, for some people who have charts that are strongly aligned with um, other houses and other areas, there may be very little that's keeping you in the world in retirement that, ha that gives you any reason or interest to be active. And that will depend mostly on your chart. If you have a busy 10th house, a very powerful or prominent 10th house ruler, et cetera, um, or even a powerful sun sign somewhere in the upper hemisphere sometimes, it, it, the urge to be a part of society, society, Ugh! <laughs> oh, it's been too long. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> that just had to oh, just get it out. So, <laughs> so you'll still there will there will be some inclination to be involved in the greater society that you are a part of. Um, and however peripheral it is, or how what in whatever interesting ways you are involved. And remember, this can be very subtle. To be to to suddenly take up the mantle of grandmother, and I am going to be a grandmother, although that seems like it's something isolated within a nuclear family or a, a family of origin, and it might seem like it's a fourth house thing. When we start taking up a, a socially recognized label, I'm a grandmother now. I'm where I'm really spending time in retirement being a grandparent or something like that. That's still a 10th house issue in terms of how we identify in the greater social world that we're a part of. Broadly speaking, the 10th house can also be about what we do that gives us a sense of relevance and importance. It bestows upon us a mantle of um, pride socially. Like, um, you know, when someone says, how are you doing in retirement? And it's a friend, you say, I don't know, like, uh, um, I have, a. Uh, there's a grandmother in our family who knits and she loves to knit, you know? So she's very proud about that. And she has friends that she does it with and so on. So the point is that there's still ways in which we perceive our lives as socially relevant and the things we're doing bestow our life with a, a sense of participating in something that has a social history behind it. Knitting is a craft that has a long history behind it of social relevance. I mean, maybe it's not as relevant to like knitting or stitching or weaving or something like that. You know, it's like, it's like people just go to the store and they buy a scarf or something, but you get the point, which is that the 10th house will always grant us a sense of doing something that's socially important. <clears throat> uh, now for some people in retirement, there's going to be a phase change, a phase, a phase change where that might look more spiritual, or that might be a, a, a something you're doing that looks very different from what you did while you were working. And so I always look to transits, important transits around the time of retirement uh, will maybe start to signal what kinds of things are going to um, take up your time. The 10th house in ancient Greek was called praxis, which also just means activity. But it has the implication of activity that is joined to the world somehow. So think about it that way. All right, let's go on to the seventh house. So the seventh house um, is going to be about our social, um, well, back to the Indian concept. It's called Kama. So that's the like the Kama Sutra. It's a pursuit of pleasure, enjoyment, and happiness. Uh, sensual, usually. So there is a sphere of human activity that has to do with sensual gratification. Now, most people only think of the seventh house as marriage and relationships, which is actually um, pretty far from the original meaning of the seventh house, which was called the setting place and was related to the nocturnal hours and uh, the gods and times of celebration. Uh, it was a, it's a very Dionysian house in a sense where the nighttime deconstructs the daytime and the concerns of the daytime world fade as those of the nighttime world are on the rise. And the nighttime is the realm of Venus and the stars and the moon. It's a very feminine space and it's much more concerned with relationship, but not because that doesn't mean the seventh house is the house of relationship, right? That would be an incredibly narrow way for an ancient 
uh, mystic to think about this place, this horizontal place. Yes, it can mean relationships because the evening and the nocturnal space where things are put to bed, the stars are put to rest, and the evening lights rise is associated with love and sex, with romance, but also broadly speaking with the worship of gods and with evening ecstatic drum circles and concerts. You don't say, I'm going to a concert this morning. You say, I'm going to a concert this evening. You don't say, most of us don't say, I'm going out for glasses of wine with my friends before I go to work this morning. <laughs> you say, at least I hope not. You say, I'm going this evening after work is over. So the seventh house in its, as the place that puts the daytime to bed and ushers in the nighttime and those evening stars, Venus's favorite place, the, the, the western sky, this is associated with Venusian things, the pursuit of happiness and ecstat ecstasy, which could be religious in nature, it could be sexual in nature, but every human pursues that area of life. And when you're a kid, that looks a little bit different than when you're an adult. It looks a little bit different than when you're in retirement, but the pr underlying principle is the same. This area of life is something that we all pursue. Now you go down to the fourth house. And you know what I think we'll do because I think this is going to be, I'm going to just, we're going to start with the angular houses and then I'm going to do separate videos on the other, um, on the succeedant and the uh, cadent houses, because I think that that'll make for, this will make for a really fun series if we break it up just a little bit. And I'm also realizing this is just the truth. When I'm going like this and I start to get this feeling, I'm like, okay, if I keep going, the remaining eight houses will not get as nice a treatment as these will because I'll start to run out of steam and I'll start thinking about the client I've got to go see in a little bit, you know, blah, blah, blah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish with the fourth house, the angular house, and we're going to go through the um, uh, the cadent or, or uh, declining and the succeedant um, houses in separate videos. That'll be really fun. So don't worry, those will come really soon, but this at least gets us started. So fourth house called moksha, and broadly speaking, again, all of these areas are areas of life that human beings all pursue. There's no one that's like an exception to this rule. Even if you're a renunciate, what are you renouncing? I'm renouncing the natural drive and instinct that I have to seek pleasure or sex, right? You see what I mean? Um, or if you're a religious person who renounces the power structures of the world, will you still have to admit that there's an inclination toward those things that you're wrestling with and discarding based on your principles, right? So all of these areas of life are innate. And there's a, there's a kind of noble and there's a way to relate to these areas of life that is in integrity. And there's a way to get lost in these areas of life through, you know, lust and vanity and, you know, power and stuff like that. Well, moksha represents the desire to be free from this world. The most basic level at which we seek this release from the world is every night we go to sleep and we are released. We just, it's like, that slumber is like a little mini death. The fourth house was associated with death as well. It was also associated with the um, transmigration of the soul out of this body and into another body because the sun in this place has gone all the way around the wheel and it will commence rising again. So this is called the resting place, but also a place from which all things emerge again. We go home, the fourth house as moksha, Home is a moksha or a, a place of release from the world. Our bedrooms, our sleep at night, the resting of being at home. And then we leave home and go out into the world all over again. This is how people have been doing it for thousands of years. Of course, now a lot of us, <laughs> we rise in the morning and we go to a room in the house where we work remotely, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> but you get the idea. It's the, the alternation between resting and release and engaging and working. And this is the place of release. So it's associated with home, but that does not mean the fourth house is the house of home. Thinking about it that way, we lose the essence of the house that actually gives us a much broader spectrum of ideas to work with when applying them to reading charts. This, these are things we go over in my program. Uh, <clears throat> programs, I should say. But fourth house, moksha, release. Now that could be as in death, um, as in departure from the world, as in solitude, as in retreat, as in the pursuit of enlightenment and release from the material world altogether. Um, but also it's the place of rest that has a long-standing relationship to home and family. 
as a place of retreat from the world, as a place of solace. So everyone pursues that and has a relationship to that at all stages of life. It might look different for, you know, a, a, a child. In the same way that like, what does pleasure look like in retirement um, versus what did it look like, you know, at 20? Very different considerations, but there's still the same concern, philosophically speaking, that the soul is naturally drawn to engage with the question of pleasure in the seventh. Similarly, when you're a child, so much of what you're working with, I mean, I, I see this in the for example, my daughter's chart, she has a son in the fourth house. And she is so she is uh, so deeply interested in what mommy and daddy do and are interested in. And she'll talk about how school and the, you know, the world and stuff like this makes her kind of tired. But when she gets home, she gets energy. That's very common for a fourth house son. In childhood, the relationship with home and family might be very literal and developmental and psychological and related to your mother and father. Um, but it also has to do with how the child is seeking a sense of release. You could call that release also a sense of safety because the fourth house is not so much like a safe, secure little fort as much as it is a released state of flow. And ideally, home provides that for us. We get home and we can be ourselves and we can flow and we're uninhibited. Uh, and that's like a homeostasis more than a static image of security, if that makes sense. Security often invokes a sense of protected, hard defenses. This is more a place of fluid release. So if safety aligns with that, you're getting closer to the fourth house. Well, that's a concern for all of us at all ages and stages of life. In retirement, the fourth house may become much more amplified, for example, as our life is seeking to go into, a, I mean, moksha is what the last stage of life was about in, broadly speaking, in Indian philosophy. At the end of life, we seek release from the body and from the world, and we turn to spirit, and we turn to things that go beyond this body, the, the, the eventual, the... The, re the exit is is coming up soon now you know we're, we're getting closer to the exit ramp for this body in this lifetime so we take more concern with moksha how do I be in flow just natural because we're turning away from the world in the 10th house so sometimes archetypally the fourth house is more active at the late stage of life ancient astrologers said that they said that the fourth house was associated with the later stages of life the 10th house, the middle of life. So that doesn't mean that the 10th house isn't active in retirement, but it might mean that archetypally the priority has shifted. Not everything in our chart is active at all times equally throughout our whole lives, which is why horoscopes aren't really the best place to go for a nuanced understanding of what's going on in your life in retirement, for example, or at some other very specific stage of your life, because the birth chart where all the planets were and all of the transits and the perfection year that you're in and where your zodiacal releasing periods are at is going to give you such a more detailed and nuanced picture than, you know, this is one of the reasons why I have such a hard time with horoscopes, right? Is because I'm really good at putting together all of the details of a birth chart along with transits and so forth. When I have to sit down and imagine uh, what, you know, this transit could mean to this house generically for thousands of people. What happens for me is like a list of tons and tons and tons of possibilities pop up and it becomes, a, it, it feels sort of arbitrary how you pick one or the other uh, to tell the story. So you try to pick themes that are going to be the most consistent and reliable, um, which sometimes also makes them feel rather generic especially when you're in a very specific situation in life. You know, I find, for example, that if I'm in the midst of something super specific that's happening in some area of my life and I tune into horoscopes, they, they barely ever get anything right. Whereas if I'm just kind of, there's nothing huge going on and I tune into a horoscope for whatever reason, the, the more general flavor seems to hit really easily. That's just me. I, I don't know. Okay, so I digress. The point is that the fourth house might be more emphasized in retirement and in 
earlier stages in life, I really think about the fourth house as things like the formation of our, well, for ancients, it was a house that was associated with the development of spirituality because it has to do with release from the world. How do you do that? So uh, the other thing is that in modern astrology, we place so much emphasis on the ninth house for spirituality or the 12th house, which is not, <laughs> there's all sorts of problems with that too. But anyway, I don't mean to demean the way that other people do things. It's just, we do things very differently when you're looking at the, the last 2000 years of astrological history compared to like the last 50. It's just really, really different in terms of the way that things are understood and explained. And that's mostly to do not with the fact that modern astrologers were like inventing some bold new tradition, but more so that they, they, they were trying to piece together a tradition that they didn't have the, the source texts for. Now we do. So at any rate, um, the fourth house is, is a place that helps us develop our spirituality at all stages of life, especially early in life. For children, the fourth house has a lot to do with the early formation of the idea that it is necessary and positive and helpful to release into states of flow and surrender from the world. And most of the time that will be through the health of family. The difficulties that we find in having a healthy experience of release will also be related to the difficulties that we find at home and in family because it is the place physically where most of that releasing for us from the world and its concerns take place. Now we need release from trying to be ourselves. We need release from Dharma. We need release from pursuing pleasure. We need release from trying to make something of our lives and pursue, you know, a respectable story socially. We need release from all of it. So this is an area of life that um, is so much broader actually than just home and family. So I hope that makes sense. And I think we've done a good job today, starting off this series anyway, by looking at the angular houses and their meanings uh, throughout all stages of life. So this is a start. We'll do part two and three with the uh, succeeding and cadent houses uh, as well. So thank you guys for listening. And for all of you out there who have suffered through uh, horoscopes in retirement, not feeling like we're addressing you or where you're at, my sincere apologies. And um, yeah, we've, we've heard you. I've seen the questions and comments coming in and I've been meaning to do something like this. And also for those of you who have parents who are wondering about your kids' horoscopes, these kinds of questions do come in as well. So hopefully this just fills things out and also serves, by doing this, it serves as a reminder for me to make sure I include some of these broader um, considerations when you know we're, we're doing horoscopes uh, in the future. Anyway, uh, don't forget uh, again that we are now in enrollment season. Be sure to check out Need-Based Tuition. If you like learning like this, Boy, our first year program starts in November, and it is a great place to deepen your understanding of ancient astrology, to learn the roots, <clears throat> and to take your practice of astrology uh, to the next level. So hope to see some of you there. Any questions, email us, info at nightlightastrology.com. We will see you guys again soon. Bye, everyone.